Welcome to another episode of Complete BS. So I went and saw Terminator Dark Fate last night, and let me just say, it was one of the worst things I've seen in a long time. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend skipping this one, because I'm a massive, massive Terminator fan, huge fan of Arnold, huge fan of Linda Hamilton, big James Cameron fan, but this one was a big, big mess. Uh, they should have never made it. Uh, nothing against Arnold. Always love and respect Arnold. And the best part was seeing him holding a couple of Coronas and just seeing him on screen for a little bit. Um, a few scenes with him holding a weapon. Always great. Always classic. But the movie itself, god-awful. Just god-fucking-awful. Pardon my French. Uh, yeah, it was just not... Uh, it was exactly what I expected, but somehow even worse. Uh, the leads were horrific. Those Those two chicks, the... The one from the future and the the girl that was being protected, they, they were just awful. I'm sorry. Um, they were pretty, but they were just like bad Hallmark actresses. They were just not very good. They were just not convincing, and the dialogue they were all working with was just complete trash. Just complete shit, you know? Um, Linda Hamilton was just kind of a caricature of herself. You know, the Sarah Connor character was just grumpy and unbelievable running around killing these terminators with a shotgun and it just didn't make sense and even arnold's character like this terminator spoiler alert was one that slipped through the cracks and big spoiler alert uh comes back and kills john connor and then he goes off and doesn't have a purpose so he develops a consciousness and or a conscience and uh goes in and gets a family and then he like has a wife and a kid an adopted kid and has like a a drapery business or something i didn't quite understand but it was just oh it was bad god it was bad tim miller did a really shitty job and just it's something that shouldn't have been made i mean genesis should not have been made a few years ago but this just took it to a new shitty level i mean the the female laid uh the, the female leads sorry the female leads were just atrocious and you know there wasn't enough arnold and the story was all over the place and it didn't make any sense at all um yeah, fuck that movie. Fucking terrible. Sorry, guys, but uh, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> After I left, uh, we went uh, went into the restroom, and one of the employees there was like, you know, I was talking to my friend about it. I was like, oh, what a piece of shit, you know? And my friend was like, oh, let me guess. Or not my friend, but the uh, the employee there was like, uh, let me guess, you're talking about Midway. And I said, oh, no, no, we're talking about, uh, you know, the Terminator movie. And he's like, oh, you didn't like it? I said, no, no, I thought it was terrible. And I think the guy was a little slow. He didn't look quite right. The employee, you know, I think he was a little, uh, you know, challenged. He said, well, that's your opinion. And I was like, yeah, we're entitled to him. And I walked away, and I know he was like, he, he looked a little off, you know, so I shouldn't have gotten mad, but he kind of pissed me off. So fuck that guy. But no, no, no. See, see, see I'm grumpy because uh, I haven't been drinking this November. So uh, I noticed my uh, irritability's up a little bit. But anyway, forgive and forget, right? Nah, fuck him. Anyway, so, so yeah, uh, Dark Fate was horrible. Skip it if you can. Not a very good movie at all. Uh, one and two, still the favorites. Still the gold standard. I enjoyed three as well. Rise of the Machines I thought was a great movie. Terminator 4, Terminator Salvation. Um, terrific effects. Terrific special effects. But the story, kind of weak. Um, didn't really do it for me. And then after that, boy, they just went to shit. Post-2010, I mean... Genesis was one of the worst things I've seen in a long time, and this was somehow even worse. Uh, so yeah, skip Dark Fate. But I will say, it kind of rekindled my love of the first two movies, because seeing how bad this was made me go back and watch a bunch of clips from Terminator 1 and Terminator 2, and even Terminator 3. And I realized just how freaking special and how fantastic those movies are. So big fan, big fan of the originals, but this one, definitely skip it. Uh, I went and saw The Lighthouse last week. That was pretty cool. Um, weird. I wouldn't say theater-worthy, but definitely still interesting. Like, worth a watch, definitely. If, if you haven't seen it yet, maybe wait until it comes on Amazon or Netflix or whatever, but 
definitely good. Great performances. Willem Dafoe did a really good job. Robert Pattinson, great. Uh, so we got to see Bruce Wayne and Norman Osborn together in a movie. Pretty great. The best thing about it, I think it'll get nominated for some awards because of the cinematography. It was shot in a really interesting way. It was a really beautiful movie, honestly. And they used like that, uh, that smaller aspect ratio. It didn't fill up the full screen. Uh, they did a good job, though. They did a very good job on that one. It wasn't exactly what I expected, but I went in with kind of very minimal expectations. So, yeah, they did a good job. It was a good movie. It could have been better. It could have gotten a little more weird, I think. They kind of took the artsy route, the you know, the, the last third of the film. It got a little too into itself and a little too self-aware, but it was still good. Good overall. Upcoming movies, uh, I want to see Doctor Sleep. I, actually, I might even go see it tonight, depending on the time. I'll try to wrap this up. I always usually aim for a target of like 30 minutes on these, so we'll see. But Doctor Sleep looks really cool. Big fan of The Shining, so we'll see what happens with that. Ian McGregor, always great. Uh, Motherless Brooklyn looks pretty cool. I listened to Edward Norton on Rogan and heard him kind of talk about it. And they filmed the movie really fast. They filmed it in like 45 days or something like that. So definitely looking forward to checking that out. Willem Dafoe, also in that, and Bruce Willis. So we shall see. Went and saw Marilyn Manson. November, was it 3rd? Yeah, I went and saw or yeah, yeah. Marilyn Manson on November 3rd. Tremendous fucking show. And I'd seen Manson twice before. He always delivers, but this time was extra special. Last show of the tour. You can tell he was in good spirits. Well, as good of spirits as Marilyn Manson can be in. Uh, his voice was very strong. His backup band, on point. Because he had a new guitarist and a new drummer with him on this tour, and they were just tremendous. He played all the hits. He played the Nobodies, which is my favorite Marilyn Manson song. And it was just great, man. It was a really good show. Got a cool concert t-shirt. Um, saw some people I knew there. It was a great time. Uh, highly recommend Marilyn Manson. If you can catch him at an intimate venue. Like like I said, the first two times I saw him, I saw him with... Uh, first time I saw him was with Slipknot. Second time I saw him was with Rob Zombie. Both great shows, but um, this one was so much better because... It was in the Van Buren, so it was a nice, tiny, intimate venue. Like, maybe, like, I don't know what that holds, like, 2,000 people or something like that. But really nice, about probably 30, 35 feet away from the stage. So it was cool. It was very special. Good show. Going to see Norm MacDonald, November 15th. Very excited about that. The man, the myth, the norm. Maybe Adam Eagle will be there. We'll see. If you like podcasts, I highly recommend Norm's podcast, um, I think it's Norm MacDonald Live. Yeah, Norm MacDonald Live. He doesn't do it anymore, but I'm definitely hoping he'll go back to doing it, because that was one of the funniest freaking podcasts I've ever heard in my life. Check it out. They're all posted on YouTube. Uh, it's mostly just audio. I think there's a couple that have accompanying video, but check it out. Norm MacDonald Live. One of the funniest fucking podcasts I've ever heard. A hell of a lot better than this one, but... Thanks for listening anyway. But after this one, check out Norm MacDonald Live. Pretty great. What else is going on in the world? Um, I had some really bad chest pains last week. And uh, I was I thought I was dying. I was like getting these really bad chest pains. And I had pains in my arm. And uh, I was watching TV one night. And I started getting like tunnel vision. And breathing really heavy. And my pulse was off the charts. And I was freaking out. I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta go see the doctor. You know, I was thinking, man, maybe I'd been partying too hard the previous month or something. I don't know. But I was thinking, man, I, I think I have a heart problem or something. So the next day, um, after work, it still continued. I was still having these aches and pains and this weird feeling. So I went across the street after work and there's a uh, urgent care, uh, pretty close to my job. And I went in there and they saw me right away. I was able to go in and get an EKG and um, have an x-ray of my chest and get everything looked at and blood pressure taken and all that good stuff. And the doctor came in and he's like, hey, so everything came back normal. He said, just looks like you have intense anxiety. So your boy's got anxiety, guys. Uh, so I need to work on that. Uh, I need to figure out ways to kind of de-stress and lessen the anxiety. But Anyway, yeah, it's kind of a relief, though, because, I mean, I thought, okay, at least I don't have a heart attack or, you know, something, like, seriously wrong with me. But, um, yeah, anxiety, guys, it happens. So, 
anxiety jokes are on the table now. Good news for me. But yeah, gotta figure that out. But I just wanted to let you guys know, anyone who's listening, it's okay. I felt I could talk to you guys about it, it's okay. Now if you have anything like that, it's very common. So, uh, yeah. Your boy's got anxiety, what do you do? But, I found the best thing is, uh, with this month, I'm also, I'm also doing um, no drinking this month. I'm doing a, a no drink November. So, I think that kind of may have elevated things a little bit. But one thing that has helped a lot is I've been doing a lot more boxing. That definitely has been helping my mood. Um, just occupying my time with things. I mean, not even just with the anxiety, but um, occupying the time that was usually spent drinking. That's kind of been a big thing. So I've been occupying my time with like going to the movies more, um, boxing more often, going to the gym, uh, hanging out with friends. Just I think the biggest thing before... When I would drink, is I was bored, you know, and it was like kind of a good, not a good, but just kind of a familiar uh, time filler. It's like I, I would have, you know, nothing going on, and I'm like, oh, let's let's get fucked up, you know. And I have a few friends like that too. It's kind of like that's our go-to, just go and party. But it was getting to the point where I think even after that little health scare with the anxiety, it kind of made me reevaluate my drinking, and I was like, okay, I need to dial it back because I, I thought that was the culprit first, you know. So it's been it's been a positive thing though. I mean, we're what are we at the the tenth right now? So yeah, making strides, making strides, a third of the way there. But the biggest key I find is just occupying my time. So anyone else who's trying to trying to quit the drinking for a bit, just uh, don't have too much free time on your hands. Read more, listen to more podcasts, hang out with people, go work out, go see movies. I went to the record shop the other day, which was pretty cool. I went to the bookstore today. Totally unlike me. I usually don't go to the bookstore. Went to Barnes and Noble. It was great though. I had a nice time. Went in, had a decaf coffee, like a little bitch, and I enjoyed myself. I really enjoyed myself. I got a book on uh, trading, on stock trading, because I don't know shit about it, but it's something I want to start getting into. So, yeah, there you go. Occupy your time. Um, not to sound like a wuss, but uh, it's kind of nice. The, the leisurely, everyman lifestyle. It's very nice. But yeah, anxiety happens, guys. Um, go talk to somebody if you need to. I might have to do the same. Some people do No Nut November. That's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? No Nut. I'm not going to do that shit. I like porn too much. No Nut November. Fuck that shit. I'm already cutting out and drinking. Give me one vice. Come on. One thing I noticed is I'm really up in the cigar smoking this month because I need some kind of vice shit. So I've been doing the doing the cigars. I'll have to dial that back, too. I sound like Bill Burr. Listen to me. Jeez. Speaking of Bill Burr, one of my recommendations, uh, Bill Burr and Burt Kreischer started up a new podcast. It's the Bill and Burt podcast. Very, very nice. That was a big treat. I was, I was looking around, and I was just listening to podcasts the other day. I listened to... Uh, the Monday morning podcast, and then uh, Fighter and the Kid, and then I, I saw it on my on my feed. You know, recommended like new new videos, and uh, it came out like I think like two weeks ago or something like that. But great fucking podcast. Funny just seeing those dudes in their element, smoking stogies, talking, and you can tell they're good friends because Bert was like very oh, excuse me, Belgian. Uh, Bert was like very laid back, and Bill was like super laid back. You can tell they're comfy with each other, so. Check it out. That's my recommendation for the week. Bill and Bert podcast. Also, Something's Burning with Bert Kreischer. Tremendous. Super funny. Very enjoyable. Uh, let's do a little bit of advertising. What do you think? A little advertising? All right. Pops and Cookie. Check them out on Facebook and Instagram. That's P-O-P-S-A-N-D-C-O-O-K-I-E. Pops and Cookie. If you need cookies cupcakes, cake, any delicious, delectable, baked goods, check them out. Pops and Cookie has you covered. All right, it's the time of the show where we check out what's going on in the news. Photographer forced to spend hours photoshopping lines from wedding photos issues warning that lasers can ruin sensors. Well, they shouldn't have had their wedding reception at Laser Quest. That sucks, though. Can you imagine that? Jeez, you get hired and all the lasers fuck up the pictures. I did not know that. 
Westworld Season 3 trailer drops, hinting at new direction for the HBO series. That looks fantastic. Very excited. I still need to finish Westworld Season 2. It got a little slow, a little bit slow there, but still a very cool series, and I love the whole concept. Aaron Paul's going to be in this one, and it kind of looks like it's alluding to the fact that it might be like Future World. So, because it, it like takes place, this one looks like outside of the compound or outside of the, whatever you call it, the theme park, so to speak. So yeah, that should be good. Fans fume after Wheel of Fortune seemingly makes mistake. Oh, we gotta click that. I'm a big wheel watcher. Come on. Let's see what's going on with Wheel of Fortune. I heard Pat had some health issue. He had like some internal intestinal issue and Vanna had to step up and uh, be the host. So I don't know if those episodes are aired yet, but definitely want to see that. I bet Vanna was like, here's my big break. Let's do it. Who turned the letters? Did she do both? I'm confused. We'll have to see. We'll have to find out. All right, let's take a look at this. There's an ad playing, sorry. On Thursdays, Wheel of Fortune... Oh, can't play the audio. Okay, on I'll just read it to you. On Thursdays, Wheel of Fortune contestant Angela Evans won big with a little help from host Pat Sajak. My boy, Pat Sajak. Evans is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps and was... Or, sorry, Corps and was part of the very special Veteran Week celebration on the show. During the final puzzle in regulation, it sounded like Evans asked for the consonant B, as in boy, but Sajak thought she said D, as in donkey dick. There was a D in the puzzle and no B. Evans solved the puzzle, drinking from a coconut, just a few moments later. With the win, Evans advanced to the bonus round in which the same thing seemingly happened again. She probably wasn't enunciating. When she was selected, her three consonants, uh, it sounded like she asked for BHB. Sajak asked, by the way, the third consonant was a D. Is that what you said? BHD? To add to the confusion, Evan said, no, B, as in boy. To which Sajak replied, no, first one was B, <laughs> then you called an H. <laughs> I bet that was awkward. I, I hope they released the footage. Eventually, they got it sorted out. I'm sure it's on YouTube. Though it wasn't much help because there were no B's or D's in the puzzle. Regardless, fans at home were upset and took to Twitter to voice their frustration. Oh, God. While Evans didn't win the bonus puzzle, she did go home with $19,800 worth of prizes. So in the end, it was a pretty good day. Or bay, as Evans might say. Go suck a bick. Yeah, shit happens, you know? I, I could see that being... I'm actually surprised it doesn't happen more often. People don't enunciate properly or have a mild speech impediment or something, or have a retainer, who knows. But, yeah, it's not that big of a thing. Seems like Pat handled it like a pro. Let's see what else is going on. Fans request refunds. Boo Madonna! After singer starts Las Vegas concert two hours late. Well, yeah, they paid big money to go see you. You're two hours late, you better have a damn good explanation. And here's my thing, when an artist does that, or a performer goes and arrives late... You know, no matter what the issue is, the audience paid to see you. Like, you're wasting their time. So at the very least, if you're going to be late, apologize, acknowledge it, and perform longer. Make up for it. Play until they have to turn the lights off, you know? Um, wow. <laughs> Man sues Madonna, saying her 10.30 p.m. concert started too late. Oh, fuck that guy. It's a little excessive. Come on. Who knows what was going on? All right, let's scroll through the news. Boom, boom, boom. Boo. Bunch of bad shit happening. Bad shit, bad shit. Post Malone brought the party to Glendale, rocking the fans like the Andrew WK of rap. I'm not a big Post Malone fan. I gotta be honest. I think he's kind of overrated. But uh, I know a lot of people that like him, so good for him. I know he's killing it right now. He's crushing it, so good for him. Not hating on the guy. I'm just, I don't know, not really into his music. The Raconteurs to release Live in Tulsa LP through Third Man Vault. Hell yeah. Anything Raconteurs, anything Third Man, awesome. Very cool. That's a place I want to go. If I ever go to Nashville, I want to check out Third Man's store. It's supposed to be incredible. Sometimes they'll do performances there. They have like, a, if you look it up on YouTube, there's a Third Man recording booth you can go into. And there's a video on YouTube with Brendan Benson going in there, and he like records a little song and actually spits out a 45. Like it spits out a vinyl, so you can go in and record something. Anyone can, like anyone who visits a store. Looks incredible. Definitely want to check that out. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Box office. Joker becomes the most profitable comic book movie ever. We know that already. So now you're going to see a bunch of other edgy 
edgy comics coming out. I mean, I think they figured that out with Deadpool. Like, that was, like, the first big superhero or anti-hero with, with an R rating that was able to make the big bucks. But Joker even toppled that, which is good, because I think Joker is way better than Deadpool. Uh, the nine richest bodybuilders in the world shows a picture of Arnold. Let's take a look. I'm guessing Arnold, probably Franco Colombo at one time. Kai Green, one million. Mike O'Hearn, two million. Guy's a strange looking character. Kind of looks like Rob Lowe. Dorian Yates, four million. Phil Heath, five million. Lou Ferrigno, yeah, the Hulk, twelve million. Ronnie Coleman, ten million. Jay Cutler, thirty mil. Rich Gaspari, ninety million. Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger, net worth four hundred million. I almost thought it would have been more, but yeah, it's still not too shabby. Four hundred mil. Uh, it's a top nine. It doesn't have a ten on there. Anyhow, cool. Good for them. Good for them. Two of the world's biggest economies are at risk of recession. No fucking shit. They're always threatening that. Sky is falling. Stuff. Rick Ocasek's wife responds to being left out of his will. Well, here's the thing with that. Ex-wife. Ex-wife. Let's see what it says. It was either his ex-wife or they were in the process of going through a divorce. They were, like, separated. So let's take a peek. The reason the car's frontman, Rick Ocasek, left his wife, Paulina uh, Poriskova, out of his will... Fans of the 80s music were sad to learn recently of the passing of Rick Ocasek. Yes, it's Ocasek, not Ocasek. Look it up. Of the Cars. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> the passing of the Cars frontman at the age of 75. The lead singer and rhythm guitarist died on September 15th of heart disease. Big bummer. With pulmonary uh, emphysema as a contributing condition. His band, The Cars, was inducted in 2018 into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which called the musical group the ultimate new wave dream machine. Totally true. Totally true. One of the best bands ever, I would say. The Cars are iconic. Totally iconic. Uh, it came to light this week that Okasik removed his wife, former supermodel Paulina Poriskova, from his will prior to his death. Find out why he made that decision. Oh, no, this better not be a clickbait article. Find out why he made that decision, plus his final sweet message of hope to his family. Uh, his wife found out... I'm sorry, his wife found Okasik after his passing... Oh, this is going to be a bummer. I don't want to bring you guys down. So I guess he had surgery. Um, he was comfy. He'd been eating. And then they found him, uh, you know, later on, dead in his sleep. It's very sad. It was his ex-wife or, uh, you know, former, former wife was the one that found him. Boy, that's a bummer, man. I don't know what... It doesn't say... Oh, here we go. The musician revised his will with instructions that Poriskova not receive anything belonging to him. He stated that the 54-year-old had abandoned him, according to page 6. The document also did not make provisions for two of his six children, although it is noted that they may have been provided for separately. Well, I mean, if they were going through some shit, you know... Here's what it says. I have no provision for my wife, Paulina, as we are in the process of divorcing. See, that makes sense. Okasek said it in the will. The couple separated two years ago. Yeah, I think that's fair. He knew what he wanted, you know? Um, I'm sure she's not <laughs> too happy about that. But, I'm sorry, was she the lead singer and guitarist and songwriter for the Cars? I don't fucking think so. So, you guys are divorced. What can you say? The man made his choice. But yeah, that's a bummer we lost him. We lost him and Eddie Money. That was a huge, huge loss this year. Love both those guys. Tremendous. All right, let's hop back to the news. Angelina Jolie photographed in the Eternals superhero costume. Eh, don't really care. Ava Mendez on working with Ryan Gosling again now that she's a mom. I don't know, having a lot of sex, but there's a kid staring at him. That's the only problem. Scores of records could fall as cold snow ice sweeps across nation. Oh, man, I'm glad we live in Arizona. I hate the cold. I just freaking hate it. I like when it gets a little cool. I like that. Like, that's nice. Like, drops down November, December, January. But 
Having to go anywhere in the morning and warm the car up and scrape the ice off the windshield, I do not like that. I do not enjoy that. George Lucas, saving Star Wars, test screenings disaster. Uh, what is this saying? Why do headlines always have to be choppy like that? Like someone is like, you know, having an issue like with a speech impediment or something. George Lucas, saving Star Wars, test screenings disaster. Like, fucking, come on. Why does it have to be so concise and confusing? New rumors have hit the net offering that George Lucas has been called to save Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Good luck. Following test screenings that are claimed to have been a complete disaster. I'm sure. The new ones fucking suck dick. They're terrible. Episode 7 was the worst. It was the worst. I haven't even seen this other one, The, the Last Jedi. I didn't even bother. I think Disney's ruining them, honestly. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Original tri trilogy, some of the best. I enjoyed uh, the prequel trilogy as well. I mean, it had its flaws for sure, but compared to the new age of Disney, man, it was great. Uh, the Star Wars rumors come from the same YouTuber responsible for the rumor offering Disney is losing confidence in Brie Larson and Captain Marvel. Yeah, she's terrible too. Uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger confirms Star Wars movies are going on hiatus for years. Dude, I highly doubt it. It's such a money machine, and even if it's a shitty product... People are still paying loads of cash to go see those terrible movies, so I highly doubt they're going to put them on hiatus. Highly doubt it. That's like saying the Marvel movies are going to suddenly stop. No, they're making too much money, dude. Not going to happen. All right. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker Rumors. It's claimed that three cuts of Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker exist. A Kathleen Kennedy, J.J. Abrams version that absolutely tanked with test screening audiences. A second one featuring mandates from Disney CEO Bob Iger, with the third from George Lucas. You have my attention. Okay. It said the Star Wars test screenings were made up with a quarter of hardcore fans, a quarter who said they are simply fans, and a quarter who are aware of Star Wars but don't buy merchandise or consider themselves big fans. And a quarter of people who are just as likely to see any movie. General audience. Uh, regarding the Kennedy Abrams version, it said the first act is said to be pretty good, scored a 65 at the test screening. I'm sure it's total crap. The second act scored a 12, really, really bad. Third act scored only a 4, with only the general audience people giving it points. The aggregate score for the Kathleen Kennedy JJ cut is said to be a 29. Just awful. A huge problem the test screening had was when Ray basically in OP fashion, destroys the Emperor, which caused them to burst out in laughter. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's totally unbelievable. Her character is like this superhero right from the get-go. And it's like, come on, you gotta earn it. Uh, Iger sat in on one of the last test screenings and said, uh, and is said to be pissed. Ray doesn't win as much as literally stomps a mud hole in the Emperor's ass. <laughs> That's what this individual says when this happens all the screeners burst into laughter yeah i'm sure it's terrible Iger is said to have apparently flipped his lid and immediately ordered a redo yeah let's scroll down to the interesting stuff let's try to find anything about george lucas's version it doesn't say anything oh here we go with kennedy abrams version and the Iger version scoring not as high as hoped george lucas who is said to have worked on some early writing on the flick offers help and incorporates both the Kennedy Abrams version and the Iger version, but during the third act, George Lucas introduces a secret Skywalker. The Lucas version is said to have scored an 88. Yeah, he should get back in. It's his baby. He's the one that created it. Um, yeah, I have very little hope. <laughs> I don't have a new hope for the, the Star Wars, the Disney Star Wars. I think they're complete trash. But if George Lucas were to get on board, eh, I'd go see it. Might be good. But I just think they're working with weak characters and shitty stories and they're trying too hard. It just doesn't feel like real Star Wars. It doesn't feel authentic. But enough of that nerd talk. Uh, we'll see what happens with that, but I'm not uh, not going to hold my breath. All right, one more bit of news. We're at the 29-minute mark. Let's look at the last one. All right, here, here's something about the Beatles. This is what we'll close with. It says, Science says the Beatles made the perfect pop song, but it's not the one you think. I'm going to guess, hmm, I'm going to guess A Day in the Life, but we'll see. Let's read this article. This is from Fatherly. 
A new study proves that Paul McCartney's foray into ska is a uniquely appealing pop song. Obladi Oblada is not the perfect Beatles song. Half the band, John and George specifically, hated the White Album track, and its place in the band's uh, discography is dwarfed by dozens of other songs with more commercial success and literary merit. And yet a new study finds that it might actually be the closest thing we have to a perfect pop song. The goal of this study from the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences uh, was to figure out what makes music pleasurable to listen to. They took 745 songs that had reached the Billboard charts between 1958 and 1991 and used machine learning to quantify the expectancy of 80,000 chords. You guys falling asleep yet? Sorry. The, s the songs were then stripped of their other aspects of original material, like lyrics and melody, presenting to listeners as auditory stimuli. All right, yada, yada, yada. Obla di obla da is the one that they said was the best. It's the one that inspired the most pleasure from listeners, with Hooked on a Feeling by B.J. Thomas and Invisible Touch by Genesis close behind. Okay, people like Obla di obla da. I, I think because it's simplistic. That's probably the thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pleasant, but... Yeah, um, I'm not going to say that's the perfect pop song, especially out of the Beatles catalog, but it's a good one. It's fun. Obla di obla da. Desmond has a borrow in the marketplace. Molly's a singer in the band, you know? Uh, favorite Beatles song? God, that's tough. Every album is so different. I mean, like, sometimes I'm in a white album mood, sometimes I'm in a let it be mood, sometimes I'm in a rubber soul or revolver mood, like... It always changes. It's almost like they were like 10 different bands because every album was so different. I can't pick a favorite. The ones I probably listen to the most are like Ballad of John and Yoko, Revolution, Rain, uh, Old Brown Shoe was a good one. Uh, I don't know. A lot of great songs. It's hard to pick a favorite, man. They were so freaking great and so ahead of their time. Anywho, that's the podcast, everybody. Um... Be sure you subscribe and stay tuned because we have some more stuff we're going to be releasing later on this month and next month. And that's the podcast. Thanks for listening. See ya.